Um, so I'm Eve Zimmerman. I'm director of the Newhouse Center, and um, so happy to see you all here today. So I'm just here to introduce the introducer, our very own Professor Lauren Holmes of the English Department. Um, Lauren, as you know, many of you know because you're her students, is the Newhouse Visiting Creative Writing Professor. I think I got that order right. Um, and um, about last March, I think it was, Lauren came to my office with a proof to show me, and it was Good Talk by Mira Jacob. And uh, we read it through. I, I mean, I read it, and my program coordinator read it, and other people read it, and the vote was unanimous. Yes, we have to bring um, Mira to campus as soon as possible. And so we're very, very pleased. But I'm not introducing her. I'm introducing Lauren. Um, so Lauren, uh, she's published a short story collection, Barbara the Slut and Other People, in uh, by Riverhead Books in 2015. It was named a Best Book of the Year by NPR, Gawker, Publishers Weekly, and more. Her work has appeared in Granta, where she was a 2014 New Voice, and in Guernica. Last but not least, uh, a fact that I had to find, I had to, uh, suss, to suss out today. Uh, Lauren is a graduate of the class of 2007, where, quote, I hid away in the English department, unquote. So um, without further ado, let me uh, hand the mic right over. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Eve. Um, I'm so grateful to Eve and Lauren and everyone else for bringing Mira to the Newhouse Center. Um, it's my honor to introduce Mira Jacob this afternoon. Uh, I'll do this too. Mira Jacob is the author of the critically acclaimed The Sleepwalker's Guide to Dancing, which was a Barnes Noble Discover New Writers pick, shortlisted for India's Tata First Literature Award, and longlisted for the Brooklyn Literary Eagles Prize. It was named one of the best books of 2014 by Kyrgyz Review, The Boston Globe, Goodreads, Bustle, and The Millions. I first found Mira's graphic work on Instagram, <laughs> um, but her writing and drawings have appeared all over um, in the New York Times, Electric Literature, Tin House, Literary Hub, Guernica, Vogue, The Telegraph, BuzzFeed, um, and she has a drawn column on Shondaland. Mira currently teaches at the New School. She is founding faculty member of the MFA program at Randolph College. She also co-founded Pete's Reading Series in Brooklyn, which for anyone unfamiliar is the coolest reading series in Brooklyn. Um, Mira's most recent book is Good Talk, a graphic memoir that I love very much and uh, critics also love. <laughs> uh, Jacqueline Woodson, I have some quotes here. Uh, Jacqueline Woodson said, a beautiful and eye-opening account of what it means to mother a brown boy and what it means to live in this country post 9-11 as a person of color, as a woman, as an artist. In Jacob's brilliant hands, we are gifted with a narrative that is sometimes hysterically funny, always honest, and ultimately healing. The New York Times book review said, among its many virtues, Mira Jacobs' graphic memoir, Good Talk, helps us think through this term, person of color, with grace and disarming wit. Celeste Ng said, by turns hilarious and heartrending, it's exactly the book America needs at this moment. A starred review in Kirkus, this is a long one, but it's worth it, uh, said, a show-stopping memoir about race in America, by turns funny, philosophical, cautious, and heartbreaking. Particularly moving are the chapters in which Jacob explores how even those close to her retain closed-minded and culturally defined prejudices. The memoir also works well visually with striking pen and ink drawings collaged onto vibrant found photographs and illustrated backgrounds. Told with immense bravery and candor, this book will make readers hunger for more of Jacob's wisdom and light. So here is Mira Jacob. Such a lovely introduction, thank you. Um, I. I, like most people that make things, you try to run away from your reviews because you get very scared that someone's gonna say like one negative thing that's gonna stick with you forever. Um, so it's actually really lovely to hear all of that because I think I was always like, what is he saying? And now I know and I feel much better, thank you. You've just saved me years of therapy. Um, so I am going to, I'm gonna read you guys a little bit of this book um, 
I'm going to read you a couple chapters, and I'm also going to tell you about the process of making this, because the thing that I always want to let people know right away when I talk about this book is I didn't come to this book being a graphic book writer, meaning I wasn't somebody that obsessively poured over comics and, um, and decided how everything should be and was like, I'm going to be that thing when I get older. I wrote novels, and I wrote short stories, and I wrote memoir, and I wrote articles. And part of the reason that I needed this particular format is because of the story that I had to tell. So I'm going to read you um, the very first one of these. Can you guys hear me? Yeah? The very first one that I wrote. OK. Chapter 1, 2014. The trouble began when my six-year-old Z became obsessed with Michael Jackson. What is obsessed? Like into, really, really into, yes, I'm obsessed. <laughs> Six-year-old plus Michael Jackson obsession equals a lot of questions. Who taught him to dance? Is that how people really walk on the moon? What is the Jackson Five? Did he lose his other glove? What is a Latoya? Is his skin like my skin? Is his hair like my hair? At first, they were pretty basic. Who is better, Michael Jackson or Michael Jordan? That's apples and oranges. No, Michael Jackson is a human singer, and Michael Jordan is a human, oh my god, stop, Michael Jackson. And then they weren't. Was Michael Jackson brown or was he white? Well, he, he was black, but his skin was brown, and then it turned white. He turned white? Yes. Are you going to turn white? No. Am I going to? No. Daddy? Daddy's already white. But was he always? <laughs> I'm East Indian, and my husband is Jewish. We've lived on the same block in Brooklyn for almost two decades. A lot of mixed race kids live on our block. A lot of everybody lives on our block. Do I look like Nick? A little. He's black and Russian. What about Claudine? She's Korean and Chinese. What about the guy on the corner who is always falling asleep while he's standing? The who? Oh, yeah. No, you don't look like him either. <laughs> Indians are not very cool. That's not true. Look at Bollywood. What? And Mindy Kaling. Who? Gandhi. Gandhi is super cool. What did he sing? Can I make my hair like Michael's? No. Why not? Because that's cultural appropriation. What? That's using someone else's ethnicity to make a fashion statement. What? You look silly. Oh, OK. <laughs> Mommy, I've changed my name to the Sixth Jackson. Wait, really? I'm supposed to say, this is my son, the Sixth Jackson? No. Just say, this is the six Jackson, and then I will show them my moves, and then they will understand. Damn. New color theory, now with more six-year-old. When I am with you, people think I look like you, and when I am with daddy, people think I look like him, except in the summer, because that's when I am super deluxe, extra brown, and daddy isn't, because maybe he drank too much milk when he was little, so I should probably only ever drink chocolate milk so I can look like Michael Jackson, right? Nice try. <laughs> what did Michael Jackson like being better, brown or white? Uh, he liked both. What did he like better? Neither. But what? Can we please stop talking about this? What color was he when he sang Man in the Mirror? I'm going to turn myself white. No, you cannot decide to be white. It doesn't work like that and I will have red lips, and my nose will look like it's falling off, and I will scare kids even though I love them. <laughs> nope. Every time Z asked me a question, I would remember all the times I had asked similar questions growing up, all the things I had been told, all the things that still didn't make sense. But why? 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 In August, an unarmed teenager named Michael Brown was shot and killed by a Missouri cop. By fall, protests against police brutality were shutting down the streets of New York. Is it bad to be brown? What? No. 
It's great being brown. We look good in colors. We have history. We don't get skin cancer as easily. Why are you yelling at me? I don't know. The TV said the police killed a kid named Ferguson because he was brown. His name was Michael Brown. He was black. He was killed in a town called Ferguson. By a white police? Policeman, yes. Ferguson is far away, right? Are white people afraid of brown people? Sometimes. How do you know? What? How do you know which ones are afraid of you? Mommy, how do you, you don't always. Is daddy afraid of us? No. No. Wait, he asked you that? If I was afraid of him? So I told him no, and that sometimes the news is hard to understand, and our son? What? Our son asked if I was afraid of him? Yes. What do we do? I don't know. Sometimes you don't know how confused you are about something important until you try explaining it to someone else. For years, I had been telling myself that America was changing for the better and that the pain and confusion I'd felt growing up here would soon be a thing of the past. Hadn't we just elected our first black president? Didn't that mean that those of us who'd always been treated like we were suspicious or invisible or just lucky to be allowed in were finally going to feel like we were safe and welcomed and loved? Now every question Z asked made me realize the growing gap between the America I'd been raised to believe in and the one rising fast all around us. I kept thinking if I could go back in time and make sense of the things I'd been told growing up, I'd be able to give Z better answers. Maybe even find a way toward that better country. Soon, though, with news of the Black Lives Matter movement flooding our televisions and the rise of Donald Trump, I would have just as many questions as he did. Okay, so that's the first chapter. And thank you. So I want to tell you guys how that chapter happened, which is that, um, as, as is evident, my son was super obsessed with Michael Jackson. He had the moves, he had the glove, he wore a hat to school, it was a whole thing. Um, and first of all, that meant something different than it would now. Um, there, were, there were less questions that that, arose, that kind of built in his mind, but the one thing that did happen was when I, I thought that I was being a genius by giving him the albums. I was like, oh, he won't be able to skip around. He'll have to listen to the whole song. It won't drive me insane. But what happened was he had all those questions about color, and you saw how poorly I did on every one of those. It was like every time he had a question, I would fail at answering it in a way that was satisfactory, especially, I mean, I think sometimes he's still confused about if you can turn white. Um, but in that moment when that was happening, I felt like... If I were to write that down as an essay, because that's what I'm sort of trained to do, right? You, you see something like that, you, you sort of take note of it in your life, you feel the weird place that it's coming from, and like especially the day after he asked me if white people were afraid of brown people, which incidentally, that actually happened on a New York subway, and we were in the subway, and he said it in like the sweetest little six-year-old chirp, are white people afraid of brown people? And it was one of those moments where everyone just went quiet, and it was so, because that's hard to do in a New York subway, by the way. And then they were staring at us. And I realized that when I was trying to answer him, I was clocking the race of every person looking back at me and thinking, what does this person think the answer is? What does this person think the answer is? What does this person think the answer is? What's OK to say out loud? And then I looked at him, and I was like, what's OK to say to him? And I didn't want to be a liar. Right? I, didn't want to, I didn't want to tell him something where later on in life he would come back to it. Because I, I have had this with my own parents, moments where they tried to glaze over something where I kind of felt the weird rubble of the truth underneath it. And I, I know that I would lose a little bit of trust in them every time one of those moments happened. So I didn't want to be that mom. But what do you say to your six-year-old son in that moment? So what I said was sometimes, because that seemed like the right thing to say until I saw his face. And I was like, oh my god, what have I done? 
And that night I went and I sat alone in the bathroom and I was just shaking and I couldn't stop shaking. And I was, and I remember kind of having this moment where I was like, what do you do with this? What do you do? How do you tell other people what's happening, especially in this climate where it seems that no amount of upset is believed anymore. It seems like if you tell people how hard it has gotten, the thing that they most want to do is make fun of that thing in you that's vulnerable, whether that's calling you a snowflake or just outright dismissing it or finding a way in which you didn't use the right adjective so they really don't believe you. You know that, like there were just so many ways for that to happen and I'm used to that happening for as a woman and a woman of color and writing online. I'm used to people sort of saying to me, well, you know, you're not, we don't really want you here and here's all the ways in which we're gonna attack you to make sure that you feel weird. What I'm not used to is that coming at my son, right? Because he's little and he doesn't ask me to sort of discuss these things. So I got really frustrated and what I did was I ran and I got um, printer paper and I drew us on the printer paper and I cut us out and then I went and got the albums from his room and I put us on top of those albums and then I drew our conversation on bubbles and I put them on top of the album. So the first version of this is actually the actual album in the back with these sort of paper puppets on top. And this amazing thing happened in that moment because I think as you guys probably noticed, the expressions never change on our face, right? It's just like you always see the same flat expression, which, which is sort of, I didn't know it was happening in the moment that I did it, but I knew just as a, as, a, as an artist that I was incredibly relieved. Like when I was doing it, I remember just feeling this kind of like, oh, thank God, I don't have to change the expressions. I'm just gonna put this thing out. And then I remember showing it to my um, editor later. What I realized in that moment is that I had an entire world of those conversations that lived in me that I could make a book out of and I pitched that book and I sold that book. I should tell you guys that that was gonna be a really funny book. Like I thought that book was gonna be this amazingly, I know the book is still funny, but like really in my head, it was a much funnier book um, because it was 2015. And because I thought naively that we were headed toward a moment where we'd be able to look at that ramp up to that 2016 election as a very dark chapter in our history that we had sort of backed away from, right? Ugh. Yeah, that person. Anyway, um, the, oh, the person that made that proposal. So what ended up happening was when I, when I gave it to my editor, he said, um, it's really hard for me when the characters don't ex like change expressions. Do you think you can change their expressions? And instinctively, I was like, no, I absolutely can't. Um, and he said, but it's weird because sometimes like, you know, your son's asking you these really ch challenging questions and you're not crying and I feel like you should be crying. Maybe, maybe what if you just have like a, a one face with this, like a tear face? And I was like, no. And he goes, what about a consternation face? And I was like, I think that's just, I have resting consternation face, so no. Um, and I couldn't quite, I didn't know until I was saying it out loud to him where I said, what happens when you see the faces and they're not crying? And he said, well, it makes me really uncomfortable because then, then I just feel like the dissonance between what I feel and what's happening is a lot. And I was like, welcome to being brown in America. Like, this is what it is like for me. This is what it is like for me to walk around and see what is happening and see what we're ramping up to and not see so many people that I thought would react or like step up or fight for people like me and my friends. They're not doing it. They're treating it like it's a season of television. They're watching it with popcorn. They're like, this is what's gonna happen next. They're not saying what's gonna happen next to my family. They're like, what, how, how bad is this thing gonna get? And so, when I did that, when I drew us without expressions, I stopped answering the people that weren't gonna believe this book anyway, right? Those people, the doubters, the people that come for you and say, your racial pain isn't real, this thing doesn't happen, maybe you're just too sensitive. I stopped being in a conversation with them and I started being in the conversation with the people that I knew lived this life too, in this body too, because I knew they did not need the emotions to know what was happening. They didn't need the cry face because they were already holding that one inside. So um, the other thing that did was it gave me a kind of bandwidth to keep going. So I'm gonna read you 
another piece. This is American Revolution. I should tell you guys, I do, I, um, I always read in my parents' accents. It's an accent I had when I was younger. It's an accent I love. And when I read them as Americans, I feel like I'm lying, basically. So you'll hear me. Chapter six, American Revolution. By fifth grade, I knew what I wanted to be, a writer. Well then, you'll need to get better in maths. To be a writer? People who are bad in maths suffer later on in life. How? They never feel good about themselves. <laughs> My mother, man, she'll decimate you. <laughs> Ms. Morell was our fifth grade teacher. She was thin and looked like E.T., only mean. She was Mormon and everyone in my class was scared of her, not because she was Mormon, but because she could get mad about anything. Mira Jacobs, she honestly, she never got my name right and I was always too scared to tell her that. Anyway, Mira Jacobs, if you insist on chewing your pencil like an animal, then I hope you will also insist on staying in this classroom for all of lunch period because you will have already eaten and our cafeteria does not permit animals on the premises. Ms. Morell had rules. If you're not in your seat when the bell rings, then you are late, as far as I'm concerned. Sit up straight when you raise your hand, or I will not call on you. Do not ask me if you can go to the bathroom. That is what recess is for. Quiet time means I don't hear a peep out of you. Take the Lord's name in vain in my classroom, and you will miss recess for a week. Am I clear? You are allowed to sharpen your pencil exactly once a day. That, by the way, completely real, completely insane. It was that weird. So we would have like hidden pencils that we would bring so we never had to sharpen ours. Anyway, Ms. Morell loved colonial Americans. She said the settlers were braver than any of us could have ever been and we should think about that the next time we complained about not having a TV in our bedrooms. She gave us assignments like make a toy from the 1800s but do not use any materials or tools other than those available in the 1800s and yes, that includes glue. Congratulations, Mira Jacobs. Your corn husk doll was very well crafted. Really? Close your mouth or you'll catch flies. We knew the Daughters of the American Revolution essay contest was a big deal because she practically saluted as she handed out each form. The topic that year was Tools of Early America. I wrote about hammers. A month later, Ms. Morell kept me in during recess. Mira Jacobs. Your essay won. We have been invited to the Daughters of the American Revolution in two weeks. You will read your essay out loud and receive the winner's certificate. I have sent a picture of you for the program. They will tell us where to go next week. Yes, ma'am. The DAR rules said I was supposed to wear a dress or a skirt and a blouse and pantyhose. The morning of the luncheon, my pantyhose kept sliding down, but Ms. Morell did not seem unpleased. You will need to comb your hair again before we go. Yes, ma'am. It was strange in her car. In my head, Ms. Morell only existed in front of a chalkboard or behind her desk. Every time she turned the steering wheel, I thought she might disappear. She had the address written on a notebook in her lap. Did you practice reading your essay aloud like I asked? Yes, ma'am. Practice hadn't gone great, but I wasn't about to tell Ms. Morell that. Is the whole thing about hammers. Yes, I told you it was the assignment. But so many pages. Can I please just read? Should I listen the whole time? <laughs> when we got to the address, it didn't look right. There must be a mistake. Hold on. She drove a few blocks down and pulled over again. She stared at the address on the paper, and then she drove us across the street to a convenience store. She made a phone call, and then another and another. She came back to the car. Her face was red. She held the steering wheel so hard it looked like she might break it. We sped out of the parking lot. Are we going back to school? No. That is one thing we are most certainly not going to do, Mira Jacobs. Fifteen minutes later, we pulled into another parking lot in a different part of town. Where are we? This is where the luncheon is really being held. Oh. I opened my door. Ms. Morell did not open hers. Listen, lunch may have already started. Are we in trouble? No. We're going to go in, and you're going to read your essay, and you're going to read it well. Do you understand me? Yes, ma'am. 
It smelled like gravy when we walked in. Some of the women saw us and stopped talking. I'd never seen so many adults I didn't know. One of them stood up and walked toward us. Hi, there must have been a mix-up. Not on our end. This is Mira Jacobs. She is the fifth grader who won your essay contest. Perhaps you would like to hear her essay. I'm just not sure we have time now. She has practiced for this. Let me see what I can do. I don't remember if there was a podium. I don't remember if I read my essay well. The only thing I remember is there was one woman with brown hair and a really nice smile who kept nodding any time I looked up. Hammers were among the most used tools of the early American settlers. When I finished, they all clapped very loudly and then everyone was smiling. They got me a piece of cake and congratulated me. Ms. Morell said we had to get back to school. I followed her out of the Elks Lodge and back to the car. I put on my seatbelt and waited for Ms. Morell to drive us back, but she didn't even start the car. Mira Jacobs, I'm going to tell you something and I want you to listen closely. You are an American. Do you understand me? It seemed like a trick question, so I did not answer. She grabbed my arm and squeezed hard. You are an American. I don't care when your parents came here. They're Americans too. Don't you ever let anyone tell you that you're not. Do you hear me? She squeezed my arm again. It scared me. I nodded. She let go of my arm and started the car. That was a very good reading. I can tell you practiced. You really want to be a writer when you grow up? Yes, ma'am. Speak up. Nobody likes a soft talker. Yes, ma'am. Then you should. Thanks. Um, so you know what's funny about that particular conversation is I did not know until I was 19. I was 19 and I was sitting in my dorm room and you know how sometimes you think of um, like a feeling that you have attached to a place and a time and it lives in your body in this really jangly, like weird way where you don't know what to make of it and it's probably not good. So you kind of don't, you just don't look at it. You're like, I'm not, I don't know what's there. Um, that particular conversation, whenever I thought of Ms. Morell, I just had this like, this like full body shame and self-loathing moment. Like I'd get really hot and then I'd get really cold and then I'd feel really sick and I'd sort of like, ooh, don't want to think about that. And then when I was 19, I was like, yeah, she was so mad at me because I wasn't being a good American. And I was like, wait, what? And, and I was like, no, because I did the thing where I wasn't, a good, I wasn't good at being an American. Wait, what? And then I sort of backed up and I was like, wait, wait a minute. And it took me that long, partially because of the tone of her voice, frankly, to figure out that she had been doing me a solid. Like she was trying to tell me something that was much kinder than I thought. I thought I had failed at something. And she was trying to tell me that the test wasn't even the right test. Like it was a really, it was actually a kind of a nice thing. It's also about a specific kind. That piece is about a specific kind of Americanism. And something I realized when I was young, which is that we're too, when I was, well, sorry, when I was like 19 now, I'm calling 19 young, um, which is that there were two very different kinds of American patriots in my life. And one was the kind that was never going to have room for me in this country. And the other was the kind that was going to like, break, like welcome me with this kind of ferocity of I am also an immigrant to this country or I am not. I have been here and this is our place and we're going to do this together. Um, I don't know when I unpack that. I don't actually know... I know Ms. Morell said that thing to me. I met her daughter last year, or actually earlier this year when I was touring. And, um, and I had written her, because Ms. Morell is, um, has passed now, and I had written trying to find Ms. Morell, and I was like, can I, I just want to, I want to be in touch with your mom. I figured out this thing when I was 19, and so I wanted to tell her, and she said, oh no, she, she died about 10 years ago. And we started talking, and I said, to her because so much of what happens in this book is about my son realizing that he's not white 
about his grandparents becoming avid Trump supporters and about what that means for our lives and the way we all sort of fractured. And, um, and I asked her daughter, you know, I was like, you know, she said this thing to me and I wonder sometimes who she would have voted for. And she said, yeah, I wonder that too. I can't tell you, I don't know. And she's like, I mean, my gut says she would never have voted for Hillary but I just don't know. And it was really wild to hear that because of the place that she occupies in my psyche, because she was sort of one of my first entry points to America and specifically the kind of American that would stand by me at one point. So, um, so, so the book sort of takes on a lot of this um, about what it means, like what does it mean in any room that you walk into? How American are you? Are you welcome in that place or not? And what does it mean to be a person in the world who's treated differently um, and has a really hard time explaining it? So I'm gonna tell you this next chapter that I'm gonna read was maybe the one that I was most terrified to write because I was sure that nobody was gonna get it but me which I just want to put out there because I'm sure a lot of you also write from that place because sometimes our stories are not the ones that are out there. So I just want to put out a missive for um, usually when that's the thing that's holding you back, you're on to something. Book business. I wrote my first novel every night from 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. It took me 10 years to finish it. When it sold a few weeks later, I was in shock. Oh my God, mom, my book is gonna be published. That's so wonderful. How much did you sell it for? Wait, what? Can't we just be happy for a moment without talking about that? Yes, I am so happy. But your grandmother will want to know. <laughs> in the summer of 2015, a public radio producer from Boston called. He wanted me to read a segment of it on air for his show. I was excited. It's great, sweetie. I should do it, right? For sure. Growing up in New Mexico, I listened to NPR every day. It felt like listening to life on a planet I'd never get to. Why wouldn't you do it? Because I'm nervous. Don't be. It's a great book. The producer asked me to choose a few excerpts and send them to him so he could edit. A few days later, the edits came back. Dear Mira, please see attached edits. We do triple backflips to make sure all of our passages are totally comprehensible. Having three characters with unusual names is confusing. It would be better with two. Would a teenager really say, mark my words? Maybe. Please write an introductory couple of sentences to set up the scene to fully orient listeners and then pass it back to us. Boston radio producer. I'd been on book tour earlier that year, so in terms of weird asks people had about the book, this was pretty low. How much of an edge would you say your diversity gave you with publishers? Your parents must be feeling so embarrassed, no? Is there a restaurant nearby you consider authentic? My son is dating an Indian woman? That guy, really, that was what he said, and I was like, what am I supposed to, yes? <laughs> Congratulations! I don't know, anyway. <laughs> I was confused. Did you tell him the book has already pu been published in 11 countries with the unusual names? I mean, am I supposed to cut a character? Change all of their names? No, come on, you're the creator. You're supposed to protect your work against bad edits. Maybe I should submit another scene. The one without any Indians in it? They all have Indians in them. Mira, oh, ha. The next day, I told myself any publicity was good publicity. I told myself I was lucky to even have this problem at all. I wrote back. Dear Boston Radio Producer, thanks for the edits. I fixed some grammatical errors. To your question, yes, this teen speaks that way. Hopefully, his distinct voice will make having three characters less confusing. For intro, how about, it's 1983 in Corrales, New Mexico. Amina, Akhil, and Dimple, three East Indian teenagers, sit on a roof waiting for the annual migration of the snow geese. That afternoon, he wrote back. Thanks, Mira. Of course, 
Any edits we do are approved by you, the creator, and we want to honor your creation. I'm your radio advisor and just want to make suggestions. We're a team to make a great teaser for your book. For intro, let's try It's the Year 1983 in Corrales, New Mexico. Three Asian Indian teenagers are up on their family's roof. They're waiting for the annual migration of the majestic snow geese. Boston radio producer. I called some friends. Hey, have you ever called yourself Asian Indian? <laughs> no. Nope. Yes, when I was lobotomized. Oops, just kidding, not even then. I'm Bangla, bitch. I called Jed at work. Wait, what's the problem? Asian Indian is just like colonial or something. Like, let's say you had to introduce yourself as a Caucasian Jew. That would be weird, right? I just think you have to pick your battles here. I know, but I mean, what do you want to do? Write him some long explanation? He doesn't know this stuff. Fine. Just correct him and move on. I know. I know. I wrote the email fast so I wouldn't overthink it. Looks good. Small fix below. It's the year 1983 in Corrales, New Mexico. Three East Indian teenagers are up on their family's roof. They are waiting for the annual migration of the majestic snow geese. The email back came surprisingly fast. Mira, since New Mexico for a lot of people equals American Indians, and Americans, alas, are not used to the term East Indians, and there are, for further confusion, West Indians, we are suggesting merely going with Asian Indians for the purposes of this short radio piece for full clarity. We hope this clears it up for you. Thanks, Boston Radio producer. He thinks I'm not American. What? Who? The radio producer. He thinks you're, he's telling me what Americans think because he thinks I'm not one myself. Honey, you're shouting. It has been a long year. No, fuck that. It has been a long life. Can you calm down and write him? Yes. I did not calm down. I took a shot of whiskey. I wrote, dear Boston radio producer. Wait a minute. Just hold on. Are you really telling me that there are people in the world called West Indians? Good God, what else can you tell me? Are there a lot of them? How many have unusual names? Do you think they'd be cool with calling themselves East of Mexico, South of Florida, Indians instead for full clarity? All best, Mira. Perhaps, in a PS, possible intro change in light of this. Don't be fooled by the unusual names you're about to hear. This is just a story about human beings. I imagined hitting send. I imagined no one ever publishing anything by me again. I deleted the email and wrote, Dear Boston Radio Producer, totally understand your need for clarity in intro. Alas, I am American. I was born and raised here. Asian Indian is just not a term used to describe us. If confusing, let's use South Asian. See you next week. MJ. Then I called Allison. A lot of times when I don't understand a situation with white people, I will ask Allison about it, which is both lazy and super helpful. I've been meaning to call you out on that. Please don't. What a dumbass. Why do I always feel better when you get mad? How do guys like this keep their jobs? That's what I want to know. It is like a full body massage. I mean, Listen, it's not that I'm not thankful. I'm thankful. You're supposed to be thankful about this? <coughs> I'm supposed to be thankful for everything. Thank you for publishing me. Thank you for asking me to attend an event. Thank you for thanking me for writing characters you could relate to despite them being Indian. Thank you for saying you almost felt like they were just normal people. Oh God, that guy. Thank you for telling me you wish you'd been brave enough to date the Indian girls in your high school. Thank you for asking me whether or not you should take a vacation to India. Thank you for telling me that your neighbor makes your hallway smell like curry. Thank you for telling me that you hate curry. Thank you for apologizing like for hating curry like I am curry's mother. <laughs> I just, I always told myself that by the time I got older, it wouldn't be like this anymore. 
But every door I get through, this guy is always on the other side, patting himself on the back for being open-minded while making sure I scrub myself before I enter. It makes me crazy. That would make anyone feel crazy. You? Would I feel crazy? Yeah. Wait, you think you feel bad because something's wrong with you? One of the things I love about Allison, one of the reasons I love Allison is because she does not panic if I suddenly start crying. I don't even know why I'm, I mean, why is this even such a big deal? It's not, so much worse has happened. But something is happening, I can't explain it. Half my friends are huddled waiting for it to hit and the other half are like, why does everything have to be so political? Where's this coming from? And I wanna yell, don't you fucking feel it? How can you not feel it? And then all these little things, things I should probably just ignore because I've been ignoring them my whole life, they feel like the only way to fight back because if I don't, all the bigger shit's gonna crush us. Ugh. They don't. What? White people. Feel it. I mean, I don't think they do. Not to speak for all of us, all white, all white people or anything. Oh. Wait, you can't do that? Speak for all of you? I mean, we had that conference call this morning, but you know how it is. The morning I was supposed to go record with a Boston radio producer, I tried on everything in my closet. Nothing worked. You look nice, sweetie. Too foreigner. What? If I look too formal, he'll think I'm a foreigner and talk down to me that way. But if I wear jeans and a t-shirt, he'll do the older guy, younger woman thing. Huh? Needs to be perfect. Wait, this is for that asshole producer guy? If I wear the right clothes, it will go better. Mira, what? This is insane. Forget this guy, he's an idiot. You wrote a great book, end of story. That's not what I'm, what he thinks doesn't matter. Jed, I'm not. You don't have to wear some kind of perfect outfit into a recording session to convince him that you're good enough. For what, his stupid radio show? Screw him, you're great. Get out. What? Now. What are you, get the fuck out of the room right now. Jed and I have an unspoken rules about fights. No going low, no getting physical, no saying the word divorce unless you're asking for one. I didn't break any of the rules, technically. I sat on the bed until I could breathe right, and then I got dressed. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have snapped. What the hell? But I'm not crazy. I never said you were. You don't get it. I was just saying, you were acting like all I needed to do was feel better about myself or confident or something. Because that guy is just some asshole and please stop talking. Do you know how much I used to copy you? What? It's true, in our 20s, I watched you walk into rooms and I would think, what is that? I want that. And when you weren't around, I would put it on like a costume. I would walk into work and talk like someone everyone knows they need to pay attention to. It was a decent strategy. Sometimes it made my bosses try to sleep with me, but sometimes it actually worked. But it's 20 years later. The rooms are harder to get into. And you know who men like this don't want, me, don't want in them? Mira, me. That's not true. It's more true than you think. It's more true than I tell you about. And you're right, by the way, it's not my fault. It isn't about me being good enough or confident enough, but you know what I'm not? I'm not the enemy. I'm not a white man. You talk like I'm some guy from the 50s who's never thought about this before. I talk like so you're someone who doesn't have to think about it because you've never had to, like you're someone who just told me to be more confident. Jesus Christ, I was trying to help. This guy sucks and you're letting him derail you. This guy is my whole life. Me figuring out how to get past this guy is all I ever do. You think this is derailing? Shut up. Where are you going? I'm talking to you. No, you're shouting at me and telling me to shut up and I've got to get to work. You're not allowed to be this blind about this. Not when you married me. What? You don't get to know this little about what it's like. Not when our son looks like me. About what's like? Your life? Z's? You think I don't know you guys? Mira? Okay, I'm stopping there. Thanks. I 
I've never actually read all the way through that one, and I just want to tell you it's a little too emotional. <laughs> Maybe not for my next one. Um, so I wrote that piece, and I just want to say one thing about that, which is um, a lot of people ask questions about how my family reacted to this work, specifically my husband, because that's a really intimate fight. That's a lot to put out, and um, especially in this moment where it's so easy to turn people into pinatas for our pain. I was so nervous about that particular part, and one of the most interesting things to me about this particular process, my husband's a filmmaker, and I wrote him several different ways in this book. Um, the first time I just almost said nothing real about him because I was scared of what America would make of him and of us and of our marriage. And then I started scraping closer and closer. And this one, I mean, first of all, when I showed him this piece, the funniest part is he was like, yeah, man, I mean, I gotta say, all I was saying is that guy, you know, I mean, he just didn't, he just, he had no right to, and I was like, stop talking. <laughs> but also amazing that we're about to have the exact same fight three years later. Um, so like the learning curve is one thing, but it was also really interesting to me that every time I wrote it, when I would say, is this okay? Is this okay? Are you okay? You know, he's an intensely private person. And he's like, I mean, I'm okay. Am I psyched that you're writing about our marriage and our fight? Not, I mean, yeah, that's not my favorite thing, but you just got to write it. You just have to write the thing. And, and I said, but does it feel true for you? Does it feel accurate? And he was like, I don't remember it exactly the same way, but this is the way you remember it. So it kind of doesn't matter how I remember it. Like, this is the way it lives in you. You're the person making this. Which is an enormous amount of freedom and trust for someone to place in you. It's like an enormous gift for someone to say that to you. Um, and it's really interesting because so many interracial couples come to me and, and read to me about, like talk to me about specifically about that fight, about this moment that we're living through and how, where that fight lives in them and how rough it's been to be a human in the world with that fight right under your skin, trying to love the family that you created and the family that you believe in and also navigate through a world that at every point is trying to position you in opposition to each other. Um, anyway, so I'm gonna stop talking, but I really, if you have questions, I would love to hear them. Yeah, are we good for that? Um, you can ask me anything, if it's too personal, I'll say too personal and we'll move on, but I'm really, I love talking to people about how to do stuff like this. If you are creators and you have your own work and have questions about that, please ask. Or if you just want questions about this, I will happily answer those too. Anyone? Yeah. Um, so, in the third of what you're saying, I wasn't understanding. Could you please explain to us what really, the root really, why was you felt like you needed to dress perfectly? So, can you explain your thoughts going through that process? Yes. Okay, so I'm just going to repeat this for you guys. Can I explain the thoughts of going through the process of what I needed to wear? Yes. So I am a 46-year-old woman. At that point, I was a 42-year-old woman. I look younger for my age than, than women do sometimes, and I am used to men of a certain age that are usually my age talking to me like I am someone much younger who they can speak to in a certain way, and that happens when I dress the way an American woman would in my head, which is like, you know, a shirt and jeans. They will, they will talk to me down in that way. If I wear really formal clothing, they assume that I'm not actually from America because I don't have the sort of cadence of jeans and that sort of the way that, frankly, is a very sort of American way to move through a workplace. And so they talk to me like somebody who they can tell what to do because I don't really own the space. So I was trying to thread the needle of what's the perfect thing to wear, which ended up weirdly being like a silk blouse and jeans, just in case anybody needs that outfit. That's a thing. <laughs> Um, but I had to kind of thread that needle and my husband really didn't get it because he has never had to do that. Never in his life has he had to do that. Like the man walks outside sometimes looking like, like he's trying to imitate a tree. Like I don't know what he's wearing or why it works or how he can walk into an office that way, but it doesn't matter for him because people just give him a certain amount of authority that I have to do triple back flips for. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Who else? 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, my question is kind of in a similar vein. I feel like a lot of those experiences um, are very visceral and trying to display them can feel like overwhelming or overly ambitious sometimes and maybe to the point where like you would kind of assume the other person wouldn't be able to get it. Um, so have you ever had any of those moments where you're like, where you kind of give up like, oh, this would understand um, or where you try to explain but you just feel like you aren't getting anywhere with it? A thousand percent. I think I have like 75 of those moments that are on the back burner right now. I will also say that I think it's a really rough time right now in America with these moments. I've lost a lot of friends in the last few years. Perhaps some of you have as well. There has been a kind of a breakage and a brittleness around this kind of like, how, how can you not get this about me? How can you not get this? Or how can you not even try? Um, that's usually my frustration. And it's funny to me that my husband will keep having this exact fight with me. Like, he's just, he keeps coming back with like, I just think you're great. <laughs> like, and you know what I mean? I'm like, we're beyond that. It's not about that. I am great. Um, um, but, you know, trying to, trying to kind of get him to understand things. There are so many things in our marriage that work that way. And then there are also times where, my God, we had this incredible thing happen like, um, Three months ago, no, maybe like six, um, when the, the hearings were going on, um, and I'm going to blank out on her name. Who spoke up? Blasey Thank you. Christine Blasey Ford um, gave her testimony. And my husband and I had talked um, about an incident in my life many, many years before. We've been together for 20 years. And, um, and those were people in the, the people in my life who had treated me a certain way were still in our lives when we were younger. And I said to him, after seeing that, I was like, this is why it was so hard for me. Like this, this is what it was like. And it was, and it was this incredible talk because he's, because when, when we were talking about it this time, he's like, oh, I wish I could do that over. I wish I could go back to that like 20 something year old dude I was when I met you and just shake him and say, like, just listen. He's like, I just, he's like, I'm so sorry I let you down, I'm so sorry. And it was crazy, because I cried like a crazy person when he said that, because it was like, oh, wow. Um, but then the other part of that was that I never expected, I never thought that particular corner was gonna be turned. And so the fact that it was, I think, I think sometimes we just think of our lives in this very short, moment to moment way and much of what's happening in the current administration keeps us in that place but life is really long people grow in strange moments things that we can't fathom about each other sometimes become clear with the passage of time and that's just real like i think so much of what we're bent toward right now is the sort of social media performance of understanding an emotion rather than the deeper understanding of it but the way humans work like the way our hearts really work, it takes time sometimes. And for me, allowing a place in me, in me that exists, that believes that that place, that like maybe we don't understand each other right now, but I'm gonna hold a place where we might in the future, like leaving that space open for me is my act of resistance right now. Like that's where I let myself resist the hardest. That's a great question, thanks. What else? Yeah. Um, this is really wonderful and, and powerful. And I'm interested just in the beginning of your talk, you were talking a bit about not having started with visual forms. And yeah. um, and I'm, I'm kind of interested, you know, I, you, you sort of described your process as one maybe like um, born out of emotion. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm interested, I, I don't know, and then this is sort of uh, uh, tangentially related in what you were saying about social media, because there's something about the form that you're describing, the kind of unchanging look of the face that actually bears some kind of resemblance to memeing. And so I, mm -hmm. I, I just am kind of wondering if you might talk a little bit about yeah. um, what you're thinking about the visual form, if you think the book could have been written as a non-visual no. book. Okay. Yes. And, yeah, so. But okay, so to answer that question, I don't think it could have been done non-visually because I don't think I would have had the emotional bandwidth to write it. Part of, of putting it all into dialogue, the first draft of this book was all dialogue and action. I had a rule for myself. You cannot say any feelings. 
Like zero feelings are allowed to be said. It can only happen in dialogue. It can only happen through action. You cannot have any sort of inner reflection. And I thought I was like a brilliant genius. And I tucked it away to my editor and just like sent it to him like, look at my genius. And, um, and he, and uh, this is my second editor, Chris Jackson, and he wrote back and he was like, yeah, but what are you feeling? At certain points, I'm not understanding what you're feeling. Can you reflect on that? And I was like, you are not understanding my genius. Um, but I realized that what it was is that I was scared to feel. At a certain point, I was like, I have done feeling. I have just had too many feelings. I don't know how to breathe in this world anymore. But because I had done all the work to set everything up, I could go back and I could hit those passages and I could actually put down what I'm thinking. So in the book, they're usually marked by um, white text on a dark background and it's sort of an internal monologue and sometimes it's like, sometimes you feel this, sometimes, and it's all the ways that your actual body and person feels in that moment. It's the unpacking of that moment. I don't think I would have been able to do that if I had tried to write it in an essay form, because I think I just would have gotten so frustrated by it. Also, I was teaching myself how to draw. I didn't know how to draw before I wrote the book. Um, I mean, I knew how to draw a little bit, but not well. I didn't know how to use Illustrator. I didn't know how to use InDesign. I didn't know how to shade. Like, I didn't know all of this stuff. And so part of it was picking up a language, but then part of it was also sitting at night with the language and being like, what are you trying to say? So I would come up against certain resistances. Like, they wanted me to use, um, uh, caption bubbles that look like they do in comics. You know what I mean? Like those beautiful rounded things with the, and they were like, let's use those. Those are, those are prettier. And I was like, absolutely not. Um, and I couldn't explain why, except that for me, the fact that they're hand drawn by me and kind of wonky and weird felt urgent. It felt like, no, this is a real person with a real hand who is making these things. And it's essential to me that you know that about me. We already talked about the, um, the expressions never changing. Another thing that happens in this book is that certain characters' bodies repeat and they're not the same character. And that came out of me waking up at three in the morning being like, America's gonna kill you because they're gonna say, America's gonna kill you is the way I just start those conversations a lot. Um, America's gonna kill you because they're gonna say that you, what you think is that everybody's just born into their body and the way that they live is just dictated by that body. Is that what you mean, Mira? Is that what you mean to say? And I was like, that's not what I mean to say. It's not what I mean to say at all. I don't mean to say that. And I was like, what do I, how do I solve that? And I was like, oh yeah, you repeat the body. You take that same character's body and you put it in a different passage as a completely different character to show that it's not the body that dictates how you're experiencing things, it's you. Um, there were just little things like that where it's like I had to kind of feel my way through the language. And just as a creative person, I'll say one of the things that is really helpful to me when I'm trying to make something is to give myself constraints like, I operate best as a person when I'm sort of tied down. So, like, if you don't change the expressions, then you really got to really gun it in the dialogue. If you don't, you know, if it's not beautiful, if it's not a beautiful thing, um, then you really got to, like, you really got to hit the notes, right? Like, you got to fly extra high if you're going to do this thing. It's got to it's gotta mean something. You cannot, you, you cannot rely on action. What does it mean when you can't rely on on movement or action or the subtlety of expression. Like, what does that mean? How does that drive you forward? And so I'm really best when I've kind of like got every, like my hands tied behind my back and then I'm basically like, okay, now I will use my teeth to get out of the box. That's where I sort of operate best from. Um, and that's what a lot of the book was for me, was figuring out how to do that. Yeah. Hi, um, so I think um, potentially, I don't know, I've read Seaborgers Guide to Dancing and um, in that, they're like, I guess, semi-fictional characters, but they're like, I, from things I have learned, um, they are very like real, and you sort of like provide as a writer like a conduit for their stories. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but how do those perspectives of these characters that are very personal to you um, differ from the perspectives that you are, I guess, like? You have that lens on both of those things, but how does that differ from the perspectives of like the very real story yeah. about your life? Okay, yeah. So how do you bring? So I'm gonna say the question back to you. It's like, um, how do you enter a character who is very visceral in a fiction form as opposed to a character who's very who's like an actual real human in your life? Is that what you're asking? Okay. So um, one thing I will say about the fiction, I didn't. I was always sort of like. You know, there, there's a character in Sleepwalkers, the mother, Kamala, who does not, is not like anybody in my life. 
Um, and she came into the book like a whole character and then she just dictated the rest of the book, which is really amazing. Um, and also really weird. Like I would be writing a scene and, and I'd be like, and then Kamala's going to do this. And I would write it and I would feel her like leaning over and being like, no, I would not, I would not do that. That is not me. No, you know, and, and she was the certain kind of Indian woman that I saw a lot growing up, the kind of saris and sneakers, you know, Indian woman that had kind of isolated herself from America, but cared fiercely about her family. My mother, when she read the book, she's like, you know, everyone's going to think I'm Kamala. And I was like, mom, I understand, but because she was like, and I don't wear saris and sneakers. And I was like, I know, I know. Um, so my mother was, you know, came here in the 70s and was a feminist and did the whole burn the bra, go forward, you know, get, get all the education you want and figure out how to be in this America and was really thrilled to be in America. So I'll tell you that the, the way in which, um, the way in which I interacted with them differently was I felt with fiction, I could be really free to really inhabit the inner lives of the characters and try to figure out what their motivations were. I didn't feel that in terms of what was happening because these are real people from my life. And, and so I didn't feel like I could, like I couldn't just make my husband say things that he didn't say. That was one rule that we definitely had where it's like, if I've made you say anything that you didn't say, and he's like, no, it's all, I recognize it. I wouldn't have put it in that order, but yes, I recognize it. Um, and same thing with my mother and you know the other people in here they recognize the conversations. They probably remember them slightly differently. But I felt, I definitely felt like I'm not allowed to just make something up. The joy of fiction to me, the joy of reading fiction too, is that you, <sighs> what a dream fiction is. Fiction to me is, right, it's, it is a little bit like a living dream. It's also, you get to care about people that you will never meet. They will never come into your life. They have no effect upon you. There is no way for you to reach them except in this like corridor in your mind where they live and they're so brilliant and they change you, which is so shocking to me. Like the, it's a living dream that changes people. Memoir, I think, changes people. But for me, writing it, it's not coming from that dream space at all. It's coming from the how do I tell this story that is very difficult. How do I tell it in as fair and forth right away as possible. And they're just different muscles. Did I answer your question? Okay, cool, thanks. Wow, okay, um, yes, you, yeah, yeah. Um, do you have any advice for women of color navigating um, interracial relationships? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I wish I did. I wish I had, like, here's the silver bullet. Um, I, after being in this one for, 20 years, I, will, I think the thing that I can tell you m most solidly is the world will give you one lens with which to judge your relationship by, or actually maybe 17 lenses with which to judge your relationship by, and it will tell you at all points whether or not you are succeeding or failing to be yourself and to recognize that person. And ultimately, that's you. Like, you're the one that counts. What you want matters. And I think it's so funny how we're taught not to value that. I know that sounds silly, but it's really, like it took me a while to be like, oh, my, my relationship doesn't have to be a, a perfect, politically smart you know, moment that all of America can understand. It can just be two people who are real, that love each other a lot and make a lot of mistakes. We're allowed to have that. And I think protecting the sanctity of that between us has been, to me, kind of the, the best part of writing this kind of a book, to kind of be able to look at it and say, like, this is what's worth protecting. You know, this is what, like, nobody can tell me what is or isn't working here because I'm in it and I'm trying. And this is where I show up to do this kind of work. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Um, who else? Yeah. So thank you for because um, it was so real, and it is real because it's based on your life, and it's essentially called memoir. Um, I, I wanted to ask you what you felt writing this, um, mm -hmm. because yeah. it's so personal. Um, I personally am also a writer, mm -hmm. and I've written memoir before, mm -hmm. and I never showed it to any of my family members because I um, knew exactly how they were going to react and what they were going to think. Mm -hmm. You are embarrassing us. You mm -hmm. have to be full of our family. Mm -hmm. um, Publishing this will put us to shame mm -hmm. um, is kind of the, one of the biggest concerns that mm -hmm. 
I myself have asthma here. Mm -hmm. um, how did you get through that? Yeah. Okay, so there's two questions there, actually. If I can, can I unpack that a little bit? Because one is purely about a writer and how do you write the truth of your life knowing that it could affect people. But the other part is really a cultural question, which is how do you, when you come from a culture that is non-mainstream, where people can look at your singular story and say, all people from this culture are like that, and your family themselves is like, now they're going to think this about us, right? Because it's like a... It's kind of a brutal thing to do. How do you like step out and do both of those things? How do you tell the truth about a life that hasn't been told before, especially when the cultural ramifications for your family can be fierce, right? It's kind of two things. Let's talk about the writing part first. Um, you said that you knew how your family would react. I just want to counter that narrative with, you might not. It, it's surprising sometimes. Um, meaning I've had a lot of the same pushback that you would think, but also, it's been kind of wild for me to see, like my mother is hilarious typically about this. Um, my mother's just hilarious in general, but my mother says to people when they say, how do you deal with your daughter writing about them? She says, oh, you know, Mira writes her stories and I know the truth. You know, it's just like, <laughs> all right, ma. Um, but also like with my in-laws, um, because one of the things that was really hard about writing this, you asked if I was scared when I was writing it. I was scared sick. I cried all the time, like really all the time. I was, um, I, at one point I was like, I think I might bust my whole body up before this is over. I um, stayed up for weeks learning how to write and draw and do this specific thing. And then sometimes I felt like a crazy person. The craziest part about it was because I had been told my whole life that you don't write about something until you have perspective on it. And I was like, well, what if you're writing it from the middle of the battlefield? How does that work? Like, what perspective are you supposed to have then? But I also knew I just needed to write it. I also think that people that tell you that you have to wait until you have perspective on your life to write about it are people that have afforded the luxury of perspective, which maybe a lot of us aren't going to get in this room. So take, taking all that in, one, you don't know exactly how your family's going to react. You really don't, even though there's dread. The other thing is, there's that to think about. And I know you can go really far down that road. There's also an enormous amount of people who have felt the things that you have felt, who have seen the things that you have felt, who have been in those families with those closed borders and with that kind of pain. And they need to hear from you. Like there is an us that is waiting to hear from you. And if you can write to us, you can find the place in you to keep going. You can't write for the people that you think are gonna be ashamed and scared and bored and furious with you because those people don't know how to meet the rest of you. But there is a huge community of other people. I mean, right? There's a huge community of other people that will see and understand your story and understand themselves better. And you have, to, you have to gun for them because that is as real and vibrant and valuable in your life as anything. I tell myself that all the time. Who else? Yeah. Uh, so I know throughout the book you were being a lot of this is a big part being like um, a POC and this living in America and it's, I think, exacerbated coming from the immigrant family. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if it was a conscious decision, because for me in Korea, but I'm always like, I'm never Korean enough. Yeah. Is it con it, was it a constant or a conscious decision to omit that sort of struggle? Because I knew you talk about the Indian and you talk about like the colors and aspects of India and like the struggling the, um, cultures, but it's mm -hmm. like, not, I don't think, as common as reaffirming your American status, mm -hmm. living in the US, obviously. Mm -hmm. So was that just something that made, was a conscious decision on your part, or did it just did it fit into the specific narrative of the story? I think I, so, um, one thing that's really weird about my family is we literally were the third Indian family to move into New Mexico. And I think you know, like, according to the other two families. Um, and so one of the things that I did not grow up with is a strong sense of Indian identity. I grew up with a strong sense of who those other two families were. But my parents left India in the late 60s. And then we were just out in the desert by ourselves. So the idea of um, being judged really came up a little later in my life when more Indian families had gotten to 
New Mexico and then would tell my mother like she's pretty much uh, I don't know about that daughter and my mom would say like nobody likes you you know <laughs> um, but I didn't but as a result I didn't grow up with that specific weight on me and so um, I think I represent it as well as I can in here being a person that went back to India every two or three years and was also just never anybody's idea of what anybody wanted their daughter to be I mean I knew that really right away so when you don't even flirt with the idea that you might be doing it right, you just go a different direction. So, you know, it was easier for me in that way. Yeah. What else? Yeah. I'm curious um, what, if anything, your son understood about the book at the time you were writing it, mm. and um, what he understands now, and, and if he's, you could use what it yet. Yeah. Okay. So great question. It's about my son. Did he understand the book? What did he think of it? Um, so here's a funny thing. So I told him when we got the copy of the book, I was like, so what we'll do is when you're a little older, we'll read the book together. And we were at my publishers. We were kind of sitting there in random house. And I was like, yeah, Zakir, you know, we're going to read the book when he gets a little older. And he goes, oh no, I read the whole thing. <laughs> and I was like, you, what? Uh, and he goes, the sex, the drugs, read the whole thing, mom. And I was like, okay, that's cool. Yeah, that's great. Okay, good. Um, great. And I was like, do you want to talk about it? And he goes, not really. And I was like, <laughs> cool, great. Um, so here's, so he is the only person actually that I gave the book to and I said, if there's anything in here you don't want in here, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to have said it or not, nothing. If there's anything in here you don't want, you cut it out. And we, and I said, I read every passage to him. And you know, it was so funny because right after we had the conversations, he would be like, yeah, 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 I said that. But then like three months later, he'd be like, oh, that's so funny, did I say that? Like he just would have no memory of it. And then even a year later, he'd be like, I'm so funny. Like he was just really, he kind of got this weird outsider view of himself. Um, and then, but I, but I did have talks with him about it and specifically because I have this um, Instagram at Good Talk Thanks and I sometimes posted cartoons of us and things we were saying and people started recognizing him around the city and they'd be like, oh, you're that kid, you're that kid and I would see him sort of shrink a little bit and I was like, okay, so we're going to have to talk about this because this book is coming out and there are a couple different ways I can go with it and his father and I talked about should I change his face should I not have an accurate visual representation of him? Also, he looks frankly quite different now than the kid that's in there. But the thing that was most, I think the thing that I was most aware of is, um, and I talked to him about it, I was like, listen, when people come at you with that, when they say, you know, you're that kid, and I was like, I, you don't have to be that kid for anybody. I wrote about this tiny little part of you, and I could never get the fullness of you into a book, not even close. So I wrote about a few conversations that we've had but you're so much more complex than the book. And, and if somebody comes at you and needs you to perform who you are in the book, you can just know that person's not a friend and you don't need to do it. You can just walk away. You don't have to play that role for anybody. And he was like, I mean, what if I want to? And I was like, yeah, okay. Um, cause, cause I think it's confusing. Like the idea of like, what does this mean? As he got older though, I mean, he's 10 now. He has a lot of, he's going to be 11 soon. He has a lot of, real nervousness about what's happening. He has a lot of fear. He knows a lot more than he did when this book ends. And he's angry, as he should be. And I think that's the part that's, um, that's, the part that's been the hardest to navigate, is when we go to readings, he'll come with me, because you know, I can't leave him home alone. He also likes to be there. But he'll come, and people will want him to be the little kid in the book. And he's not that little kid. And so I've actually started saying, you know, at readings like, this is my son, he's older, and like, don't ask him to perform for you like a monkey, that's weird. You know, I just say it so it won't happen. Um, it's, been, it's been a thing to navigate. And kind of having him have an inside and outside version of himself is not, it's been, it's been curious. Yeah. He always says that he's like, I'm okay with it. And I'm like, yeah, wait till you're 16. You know? <laughs> what else? Yeah. I was wondering, so you have different versions of yourself throughout the book. Mm -hmm. How did you choose like which like different phases of your life to portray yourself with the drawings? I mean, I was just trying to hit like rough, you know, rough gaps in aging. And sometimes they're not obviously because they're just I use one stand in character from like eight to 11, I think. I mean, I know I changed in that time, but I just used that character there. Um, I was just trying to both use the sort of visually accurate the thing that would make other people be like, oh yeah, I had that weird haircut, you know, oh, I had that weird shirt. Um, 
trying to place myself within the context of America so that other people that were reading this could, could understand how, like, what that looked like on me and that I was there the whole time. Like, nothing makes me more furious than when people act like diversity is a thing that just happened. When they're like, oh, yeah, it really matters now. And it's like, we've been here the whole time. Like, look, look at what that looked like. So that was part of what this was. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Um, I want to say thank you for sharing that narrative with the Boston radio producer, which honestly really affirmed that I'm not crazy. Because I've gotten into just conversations with like friends and family about like, why are you choosing this hill to die on? I'm like, I'm not sure actually, but just showing that intersection of like gender and race and how to take back that authority when you walk into a room that people don't want to give you yeah. and you don't really think you deserve. But I was just wondering if you have any advice for you know like all the young women in this room on how to do that and how to feel confident when you walk into a room and know that you deserve to be there just as much as anyone else. Yes. Oh, that's so um, real and visceral, and it's something that I still go through. The question was, how like do you have advice for people to um, to feel confident walking into that room in which people undermine your authority? Um, here's what I would say, because I don't have like a shield for you. I want to give you a shield. I don't. I don't have that shield for you. But what I can tell you is, it's usually in the after moments of that situation that you unpack it and you decimate yourself for all the things you didn't do all the things you didn't say, what you could have said, maybe you said too much, maybe you said too little. And I think the thing that I would want to tell you more than anything is there's no perfect way to get through that. You just asked, like, why did you choose this hill to die? You didn't choose it. There's no perfect way to get through a moment that is not of your choosing and not of your making. There's only you in your body reacting. And whatever way you did it was the best you can do. So don't decimate that person after. Like, that person's the person that's showing up for you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Um, I was wondering, because you shared this book so widely, um, and gone on tour with it, how you kind of, when you share it with people, how you protect like yourself and your story when you're doing that. Yeah, that's such a good question. How do you protect yourself and your story when you share a part of your life like this? Well. Okay, so I do have things in my head that like I won't answer, but there's also I think um, I think people tell me a lot of things about their lives um, that are really harrowing, and I think they need to, and I kind of understand that, and I also understand that I can't hold on to them. So the way that I protect myself is to listen in the moment because I think sometimes when people show up to tell you something, they need to be heard, and I get that but I don't hold on to them afterward. Like I, I literally do a thing after I meet a lot of people where I go to my room and I let all of their stories go so that I can find my own. And I kind of imagine them going to a safe place in the world that takes care of people's hearts and their stories, but they're not mine. They're just not mine. Um, the other part of that is dealing with people that are angry because there are a lot of people that are angry. And I have told myself that it's not my responsibility to make people that are angry less angry because I didn't make them angry in the first place. So I don't try to argue with people that say, but, but okay, but, you know, they want to have that kind of theological argument with me that's based in like, but let's talk about how I'm really right. And I'm like, you can talk about that. You can do that. I'm going to be over here writing another book. Enjoy your life. What else? Yeah. That was my question. What are you working on now? Oh boy. Okay. Um, so I feel like you feel like, oh my God, I'm going to jinx it, right? <laughs> um, so right now I'm doing an experiment. I don't know if it'll work. Um, I have a uh, four part narrative, one of which is entirely visual. I'll see how it goes. Um, fiction. I want to go back to fiction. It feels like the right, it feels like the right thing. I've also been waking, making these really weird slideshows just for my own, like, joy on Instagram, just these really weird, I don't know why, and somehow that's also where I'm channeling all my weirdness right now about all this, all like the earth and everything else that's happening on it. So that's weirdly a creative outlet for me right now. And I wish that I could have like some sort of slideshow tour in which I show stories that are slideshow stories and then talk about that. I don't think there's a universe that will allow that, but if there was, I would do it. Yeah. Yeah, speaking of like experimenting, you talked at the beginning about how this was a new form for you yeah. and then how 
uh, it was the subject matter that called up this form. Yes. It needed this form. Um, and so clearly you had to learn it through probably trial and error. And so yeah, yeah. How, do you have advice for people developing technical excellence? A thousand percent. Yes, yes, yes. I do have advice. This is one that I actually have advice on. Okay. Um, okay, so here's the thing. So if I would have looked at this from the outset and I would have said, oh my God, you don't know how to draw, you don't know how to do InDesign, you don't know how to, like, you don't, like, you don't know what, how to make a font, I made my own font for this, you know, like all of this stuff, if I would have thought from the outset, you have no idea how to do any of this, I would have like fully panicked and shut all the way down, but here is what I know now after finishing this process, and any, anyone who's written a book, anyone that's gotten through it will tell you, you can't think of the whole of all the things you have to learn. You have to think of the thing that you need to learn for today. What is the thing you need to learn for the day? Like get yourself that just break it down into doable parts and keep walking because you will get there. Like that's the wild thing about this. The entire 10 years that I was writing my first novel, I had no idea that I was a writer and if someone would have said that to me, I would have been like in my brain only. But you're a writer every time you show up to write. You're an artist every time you sit with a problem in your head and just walk toward it. Just keep walking. Just keep walking. Don't worry about, have I learned all the things? No, you haven't, and you won't. And you'll still have questions afterwards, and that will go into another project. But you will get to the point where you have enough facility to do the thing you want to do. That is, in fact, the art. The art is keeping walking. Does that make sense? OK, cool. Um, yeah, are we good? Oh, sorry, I don't want to keep everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming.